Welcome to the first of a series of three special health policy breakfast lectures generously sponsored by Emblem Health, with additional support by Hofstra's College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, the School of Education, Health and Human Services, Hofstra's Law School, and Hofstra's Educate 08 initiative. We are extremely pleased to have Dr. Stuart Altman help us kick off this important series. The series will set the stage for an international conference that Hofstra University is hosting in March of 2010 called New Directions in American Healthcare, Innovations from Home and Abroad. We have copies of our newly published Call for Abstracts available today. The American healthcare system is at a critical juncture. Barriers to accessing care remain insurmountable for some and increasingly challenging for others. Quality of care, disparities in quality of care are pervasive. Costs are alarming for patients, providers, employers, government, and the economy as a whole. With a new administration on the horizon, those of us who have studied the evolution of American health care can't help but compare the influencing factors that have dictated the direction of reform in the past. As one of the most knowledgeable analysts of health care reform, whose career participating in the policymaking process and in educating healthcare professionals has spanned four decades and six presidential administrations, there is no one better to help us grapple with the current state of healthcare and reform than Dr. Stuart Altman. We are very excited about today's lecture and pleased to have those in the audience engage in this important discussion with us. I'd now like to invite Dr. Iran Ron, Senior Vice President and Chief Medical Officer of Emblem Health, the sponsor of this Health Policy Breakfast Lecture, to the podium. Dr. Ron will tell us a bit more about our esteemed speaker. Good morning. Good morning. It's my privilege to introduce Dr. Stuart Altman. Dr. Altman is Dean of the Health School for Social Policy and Management and Saul C. Kagan, Professor of National Policy at Brandeis University. He has an MA and PhD degree in economics from UCLA and taught at Brown University and the Graduate School of Public Policy at the University of California at Berkeley. Dr. Altman is an economist whose research interests are primarily in the area of federal and state health policy. In 2006, Health Affairs listed him among the authors of the 25 most read health affairs articles and 25 of the read, most read health affairs papers online. Modern Healthcare, celebrating 30 years, listed Stuart Altman among the 30 people who have had the most influence on healthcare over the past 30 years, and for the past six years, they named him among the 100 most powerful people in healthcare. Now we know who to blame for this problem. In June 2004, he was awarded the Academy Health Distinguished Investigator Award. From 2000 to 2002, he was co chair for the Legislative Health Care Policy Task Force of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. In 1997, he was appointed by President Clinton to the National Bipartisan Commission on the Future of Medicare. Dr. Altman was Dean of the Florence Heller Graduate School from 1997 until July 1993 and Interim President of Brandeis University from 1990 to 1991. He served as Chairman of the Congressional Legislative Prospective Payment Assessment Commission for 12 years. PROPAC was responsible for advising the U.S. Congress and the Administration on the functioning of the Medicare Diagnostic Related Groups, Hospital Payment System, and other system reforms. Dr. Altman is a member of the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences, a member of the board of the Tufts New England Medical Center in Boston, Massachusetts, and co-chairman of the advisory board of the Schneider Institute for Health Policy at the Heller School for Social Policy and Management at Brandeis University. In addition, Dr. Ullman has served on the board of the Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars Program and on the Governing Council of the Institute of Medicine. He is the chair of the Council on Healthcare Economics and Policy, a private nonpartisan group whose mission is to analyze important economic aspects of the U.S. healthcare system and evaluate proposed changes in the system. He is also chair of the Health Industry Forum, which brings together diverse group leaders from across the healthcare field to develop solutions for critical problems facing the healthcare system. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Altman. Well, thank you very much. My good friend was nice enough uh, not to mention, but I will mention that I'm also on the board of Emblem Health, and I'm very proud of that, and uh, had the chance to work with Dr. Ron. 
and several others, and David Weiss, and, um, and I appreciate uh, the fact that uh, Emblem has finally got around to honoring me by uh, hosting this breakfast, so uh, I'm, glad, I'm glad to say they finally you know, got out to the plate. Um, it is great to be uh, back in New York. Uh, <clears throat> I'm a New Yorker by uh, birth, um, lived here uh, most of my growing up years, went to City College in New York. Um, and then uh, somehow lost my way and went to California. Um, but I'm back, uh, at least on the East Coast and freezing like the rest of us. Um, it is true that I have been part of the healthcare system, and as Aaron has pointed out, all of the problems I've created. And it's my fault, and I apologize. And, um, uh, and, but you see, I have to tell you, for those of you who are students, um, your professors are very wise. I mean, we do it more. We're fine. Yeah. Oh. So, um, oh. catchy on the top. Okay, well, the next one will be better. So, um, uh, you know, we're, your professors are very wise and talk about, you know, I, but our job really is to not only solve problems, but to create other ones so we can continue in this business. I mean, if all of a sudden, if I had solved all the problems in 1971 when I got started, I mean, what would I have done for the next 40, 50 years? So what we're really counting on is you, the next generation, to solve the problems. Uh, it's my, it was my generation that screwed it up. So. Now, um, I, as you heard, I was trained in economics, uh, and we really didn't have health policy as a field like we do today. And those of you who are being trained, I really appreciate it, and we, we're training some up at Brandeis. Um, but um, health policy is a relatively new field, um, and it links in and, and has you know, a lot of people that are now involved. And, but when I first started, I had absolutely no training whatsoever in healthcare. And um, it's sort of a kind of a complicated story, but all of a sudden I found myself as the chief health policy person for the United States. Now, <clears throat> how does someone whose main interest is women get involved in studying health policy? Well, that was my, I had written my dissertation on unemployed married women, and uh, I'd written a book on uh, the supply of nurses, and um, now what, I don't really, tell this story sober, so I'm just going to let it slide on my <laughs> talk the time. But there I was in 1971 with absolutely no experience, and I became, I was the chief health policy person in the United States. And I'd written on my sleeve, you know, Medicare for the older people, Medicaid, you know, this is probably what you do with your exams, you know, you write down on your sleeve all the things you're supposed to remember. And I, I had just begun to understand healthcare. This is, and most of you may not have been born yet, but this is uh, 1971. We had a very conservative president, Richard Nixon, was president of the United States. And he imposed wage and price controls on this country. Now, for a conservative Republican to oppose wage and price controls is not something that happens often. Now, I didn't, truth of the matter is he did it on a Sunday and I didn't much care. I didn't even know because uh, my little seven-year-old daughter had scored a goal in her soccer team, and I was really very pleased. And I came into work on um, on uh, that Monday morning, and uh, I had just figured out where my office was, where the men's room was, where the ladies' room was, and it rolled down path. And my secretary was as white as a ghost. And I said, "Well, what's the matter?" She said, "The White House wants to see you." Now, you may not have heard about this, but this was an era where Haldeman and Ehrlichman were in the White House. People went to the White House and were never seen again. This is not, <laughs> not, not something that, as a 32-year-old, you really want to have happen. Yet. So I went up to my desk, and after about 15 minutes, they said, you, you really better go. <laughs> anyway, I went to the White House, and sitting around the table were all the president's men. Sorry, no women. And they're all sitting around the table, and the chairman of the council of the economy advice said, Dr. Altman, how much money we're spending on health care in America? I knew because somebody on my staff had told me because I didn't know either. But before I had a chance to tell him, he said, we are spending $75 billion, amounting to 7.5% of our gross domestic product, and it's going to be your job to make sure that doesn't go up. My president wants me to control health care costs. I am going to control health care costs. And this is how successful I've been. <laughs> <laughs> 
For those of you who've been part of the field, we've grown from 75 billion to 2.4 trillion. We've gone from 7.5% of our gross domestic product to 16.5%. And now that we don't have a gross domestic product anymore, it's going to really shoot out in the next six months. <laughs> So the, the moral of this story are two things. One, I don't know how much this country is prepared anymore. And somehow our way of life didn't deteriorate. Um, Americans want more health care. They want good health care. They want access. They want equality, which is what we're striving for, which we have not yet, with all the money we're spending, we still have 47, probably now, by now, over 50 million Americans with no health insurance. There's tremendous disparities, which some I know some of you were studying. And yet our health care spending goes up. So part of me says, well, you know, we could keep spending more money. But what we have found is even though there are parts of our health system that are doing a good job, and we in academia in particular are busy finding faults all over the place, and that's our job. But it's not really the whole story. I mean, there are a lot of wonderful things. People like me, unfortunately, you know, 20, 30 years ago probably would be dead. Or at least we wouldn't have enough stamina to get up here and talk early in the morning. Now, it is true that I'm a pill popper, you know. I mean, if it wasn't for pharmaceuticals that, that are keeping me going, you know. It's all legal. None of this. Don't smile. So um, we have done a number of very good things. However. These rising health care costs have generated a lot of problems. And in particular, the one I'm just going to focus on in the beginning, is that we depend in this country today on voluntary decisions by millions of employers to provide health insurance to their employees. This is not compulsory. Yes, there are people who are on government programs. Those over 65, those suffering from renal, those who are too poor under Medicaid, veterans, and so on. But for most of us that are working, or will be working, or hope to be working, you know, we depend upon our jobs. And employers are faced with the idea that they have to provide wages, and they also have to provide health insurance. And as health care costs get more and more expensive, we have found that these premium growth, in blue, have begun to take their toll. Now, I shouldn't say this since we're you know, talking about Emblem Health and we're talking about insurance companies, but insurance companies have really increased premiums. Now, I want to make it clear Emblem's increased premiums haven't been nearly as much as these, but these are the increases that we've seen over the last um, 20, since basically 2000. And you can really see the problem when you look at this slide. Since 2000, premiums on average have gone up over 90 percent, while wages have gone up only 20 something percent. And as a result, um, employers are having a tougher and tougher time. Not surprisingly, when you look at the proportion of employers who provide health insurance, we have seen a rather significant reduction since 2001. Now, when you look at, which means that fewer and fewer employers feel they can afford to provide wages and jobs and also health insurance through the job. Now, let me talk a little about politics. There are two groups that see very little eye to eye on anything. But in this case, there is a kind of an interesting coalition of, of interest. Our political left, you know, excuse me for using that vernacular, but there have been a very significant number of Americans who believe that the government should support the whole system. Why should we be any different than all of our European friends and major other uh, trading partners? We are the only country, really, in the world, major country in the world, A, that doesn't have compulsory health insurance, and doesn't do it through the government. And so this group, which is not insignificant, and I'm sure around this campus there are many people who believe it. I know Brandeis is loaded with them. Um, we have people that believe that you know the government should provide health care to everybody, just like it provides it to the poor or to the seniors. Why not do it for everybody? 
So they look at this issue and they say, good, let's get rid of all this employer-based insurance and then we can do what's really right. Well, they've been arguing this since the 1920s. And so far, uh, Americans have rejected it, which is another interesting story I'll get to in a minute. But now they have a new group, political bedfellows that never have been in bed together before. And that is the political right. Now, the political right, um, and you saw that during the presidential campaign uh, because of the uh, proposal of Senator McCain, the political right those who are at a number of economists, by the way, you don't want too many economists together there. You know, individually we're okay, collectively we're okay. So the political right believes this is the wrong way to provide health insurance through your job for a lot of reasons. First of all, I think you're probably aware, and the classes you should have been aware, that if an employer provides health insurance to their workers, that insurance is not considered income and therefore is not taxed. Which means if, if I get a $10,000 raise, I should be so lucky, um, from, from Brandeis, I have to pay taxes on it. But if Brandeis pays $10,000 for my health insurance, I don't, it's not considered income. And therefore, I don't have to pay taxes on it. And given the fact that the tax system is progressive, the higher the income of the person who gets it, the more I benefit from not having a tax. So the right, the economists say, well, that's not fair. Second, they don't like the idea that it sort of mix, mix up the labor markets. And what they want to do is what I'll talk about in a minute. Senator McCain advocated, tax it, and then provide everyone with a voucher and let them go buy private insurance. And that will force people to have to be more concerned about the cost and will allow them to pick the kind of health insurance that they want. So here we have the political left and the political right wanting to get rid of the employer-based system. I'm sorry, not me. I am by nature a radical moderate. I scream a lot about small changes. I have been part of health reform since the mid-1970s. So it's partly what I believe, but it's also what I believe Americans want. Americans by their nature are not Want, do not want radical changes. Now, they talk a lot about it, but I was part of the Clinton transition team. I was part of the Nixon policy thing. I worked with Senator uh, Kennedy. I've worked with, I mean, and I re and we're going to talk about that because now we're at a very unique juncture. So I am both pragmatically believe that Americans don't want it, and I also think it causes all kinds of problems. There's a lot of advantages to a single payer system. It's simple. It's fair. It, it can be done. Other countries have done it. We could do it. But it would put government and 32-year-olds like me in charge of a very <laughs> complex health system. And not only that, actually it would hurt those aspects of that government needs to do because healthcare is going to dominate. So it doesn't matter much what I want. The question is what are we going to do? Because we need to do something. Would I go crazy if we had a single payer system? No. I'm on Medicare. It works. But I'm not sure I want everybody on Medicare. I mean, it's like a club. You know, I'm not going to keep people out. <laughs> so the point here is where are we going? Oh, by the way, I just thought I would give you a little statistical thing. Those same numbers that I showed you before look terrible. If you look at it and put the, the axis at zero, the, the reduction isn't really terrible. It's down. So when people scream and yell, there are two things you hear, as I do when I go around the country. One is our employer-based system is collapsing. And two is our health care spending is so high we can't afford to cover the uninsured until we control health care costs. In my view, both of them are free. That's a technical term. We do not necessarily want them. So the question is, many say we can't cover it, health care, expand coverage to everybody until we control health care costs. I hear that all the time. I believe when I hear that, the person that said it really doesn't want to cover everybody. Why? Controlling health care costs is hard. Covering everybody is not hard. Simple. I mean, there are a lot of ways you can do it, it's just money. 
But when you look at controlling health care costs, you begin to, why is it so difficult? Well, it turns out that pe millions of millions of people provide health care, insure health care, supply services to health care workers. It is either the first, second, next to Walmart, it's the largest industry in America. Every you go city by city and you find out what's the largest employer. It's the hospitals or the doctors or the insurance companies. They add them all together. And when we talk about controlling health care costs, it's really controlling health care spending. Do not be mistaken. What we're talking about is spending less. And when we spend less, less will be available to all these groups. It'll affect wages in health care. It'll affect earnings of workers all over the place. It's not only going to be those damn insurance companies. I can't say that. Emily, for my breakfast. But it is true. A lot of people say, if we get rid of the insurance companies, we can solve all our problems. We can solve a few, but not all of them. Or the pharmaceutical companies make it too much money. Truth of the matter is, healthcare in America is big business. And not only that, one of the things that's going to happen, other countries tell patients, you can't have that. We don't think you could have it. We don't think you justify it. Um, it's not worth it, or something like that. They say no. America says no, but much less than, you, than in other countries for certain people. And then there's a bureaucracy, and so on and so forth. And then finally, politicians. What politician is going to get up there and say to you, you know what, you know, elect me, and I will cut your wages, and I'll reduce spending, and, you know, and, you'll have, and I'll make sure that you can't get that open heart surgery. You know, they're not going to say that. You know, they talk about things like prevention. You know, who could be against prevention, and, and needless waste, and inefficiency. I mean, they use words like, somehow it, it'll just evaporate. And so they really aren't serious about controlling health care spending either. When it all gets said and done, health care in America is big business. In other countries, it's a social service. And the question is, are we, are we really going to change that? Now, as I said, I've been at this for 45 years. I've been trying to control health care spending. I know how hard it is. And so what I say is let's get, why should we hold uninsured hostage to solving this problem? Let's get everybody under the tent. Let's let everyone have the same health care insurance that I have. And then let's collectively try to decide how to control health care spending. That's what we did in the state of Massachusetts. You know, I am proud of being part of Massachusetts. We did something that no other state in the United States, Hawaii did a little of it. We did something that no other state did. We said, we are going to put everybody, have everybody have health insurance. And then we're going to worry about how to control spending. <clears throat> and we did. We have the lowest uninsured rate in the country. We're down, you know, before this recession, but we were down to 3 to 4% uninsured. The average in America is like, you know, 15, 16%. It depends on the part of the country you're in. And we said, we're going to cover everybody. And, we said, and we'll do it through the private insurance as much as possible. And if we can't, we'll create kind of semi-private. And then we'll worry about controlling spending. And that's what we're trying to do now. And it turns out to be very hard. So I believe we can do it. Not only that, when it really comes down to it, covering every American isn't that expensive. Why? Well, about a third to a half, 45% of the uninsured are young. I mean, there are students that are, you know, like my daughter or you guys, you know, you finish college and say, gee, Dad, I've worked really hard in college. I think I'm going to take a year off and go skiing or, you know, go, you know, surfing or travel around Europe. And, and if you're like me or the other fathers, you're going to say, how are you going to have health insurance? They say, well, I don't need health insurance. I'm healthy. I'm going to live forever. And so a lot, and then where you get jobs that don't provide or something like that. So a lot of our uninsured are young. There's another group that aren't so young and are very sick. And fortunately, our American system provides them with care. We spend billions and billions and billions of dollars on very sick uninsured people. And if you know anybody in the hospital industry, they'll tell you the percentage. I don't know, have people from North Shore here? Anybody here from? And uh, you know, they're providing services for free. 
but we have a problem. We, we, the uninsured aren't perfect. They have trouble getting primary care. They have trouble. They wind up in emergency rooms where they shouldn't. So the point is, it, they need to have the same kind of protection that I have. And we figure it'll probably get about five to seven percent in spending. Now that turns out to be a little over a hundred billion dollars. But I'm from Washington. A hundred billion dollars is not a lot of money. People say to me, not a lot of money. A hundred billion dollars. Where are we going to get it? We can't afford it. You know what I say to them? We're going to go to the same store where they found the 700 billion to be the banks. We're going to knock on the door, go boom, 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 boom. You know, can you please give us a hundred? And they're going to get it the same place they got the 700 billion, which is if you go behind in the store in the back room, you know what they're doing? They're just printing it. You know, you want 100? Okay. You know, so 100 billion dollars is a lot of money, but it isn't, when you compare it to what we're already spending, it's 5 to 7 percent. Now, I, I, you know, I can't resist, I, I, I appreciate that 100 billion is not a trivial amount of money. I should tell this little story, I'm not going to do with anything, but back when uh, President Clinton ran for office in 1990-1991, he made health care his primary area in domestic policy. And um, then he won the election, like Senator Obama won, and there was a transition team set up, like they're setting up now. And I was part of the senior team that was part of to design a health care. And so we busy working day and night doing this from Thanksgiving to January 20th. And we were almost finished. And it was about a week before the president was to come up. And uh, all of a sudden we were summoned to Little Rock to explain our plan. And so we were very proud of ourselves and we got into these little jets and we flew down to Little Rock and everybody was there. The president was there, Mrs. Clinton was there, the, Al Gore, who was the vice president-elect, was there, and mm, Secretary Rubin, and, oh, just everybody, Stephanopoulos you see on television, they were all there. So it was our big opportunity. And we got up there, there were four of us on the team, and I don't know, it was me or somebody said, you know, Mr. President, you can, we have it all worked out, you can do everything you want. You can cover the uninsured. You can provide prescription drugs to people on Medicare, which they haven't done yet. We can cover the mentally ill. We can do everything, and it will only cost a hundred billion dollars. And he goes, a hundred billion dollars. We go, you know, but at that point it was a little over ten percent. We said, but it's only ten percent. He kept saying, a hundred billion dollars. After the third time, we knew we were in trouble. You know, this was so a hundred billion dollars, not chicken feed here. And, and he said, I don't know, where are we going to get $100 billion? Now, I'll never forget this. There was a guy who raised his hand. Now, if you know the history of the health care reform in, uh, under the Clintons, uh, I won't go give you all, but there was a guy in the back of the room, I'm going to call Svengali. <laughs> and Svengali said to the president, Mr. President, there's an alternative way to look at this, and you can do everything you want, and it's going to cost nothing. President's happy, smiling, Hillary's smiling, Gore is smiling, everybody is smiling, except me. I don't know if you, you're, many of you are too young, but there was a movie called Dr. Strangelove. You should go see it. And Dr. Str and Dr. Strangelove, Dr. Strangelove had this arm that, it just, and my arm went up like that. The president said, Stuart, what is the problem? I said, Mr. President, I know what they're thinking. This isn't going to work. I said, they're going to be moving everybody around. They're going to be changing everything. Svengali was the most, he was a very smart guy. And, but he was you know, too smart. And he had this all complicated system. I said, this isn't going to work. And he said, are you sure? I said, well, I'm not sure of anything, but I've been doing this now. I'm no longer 32, by the way. I said, you know, I've been around a long time. Americans aren't going to stand for this. Well, if you know the history of, of course, he put out a 1,300-page bill, it was the most complicated, moved everybody around, created all this complicated. It was, from an analytical point of view, it was fascinating. It was wonderful. It had lines and it had presented. It was a disaster. And of course, the Americans just went, it was gone. Zero. Bang. So I realize 100 billion is not trivial, but I also realize 
that when you get it so complicated, Americans get very nervous. Now, the question is, are we such a heartless group of people that we are so unwilling to cover everybody? And the truth is, some of us may be heartless, but most of us aren't. 75 to 85 percent of Americans believe we should cover everybody. So if we believe it, why is it so hard to create one? Why can't we do it? Do you realize we have been trying to do this since the 1920s? Woodrow Wilson even talked about it. Harry Truman, in 1946, ran and uh, by flu won, and one of his platforms was covering everybody in a governmental system. Even Franklin Delano Roosevelt during the Depression toyed with the idea of covering everybody. And he, we, he didn't do it because he, he decided to do Social Security instead and all the other things. Um, as I said, uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson, when he passed Medicare in 1965, thought about doing it and didn't do it. And then Nixon tried it in 74, Clinton tried it in 1994. <clears throat> Every time we've tried it, we have failed. And the question is why? And I've come up with Altman's Law. <laughs> and I've been watching this now for 40 years. And Altman's Law goes as follows. Most every constituent group supports some form of national health insurance, but if it's not their version of the plan, their second best alternative is to maintain the status quo, which is my way or the highway. I was there in 74, I was there in 1994, and I saw the same thing. Every group has their plan. The American Medical Association, the American Hospital Association, the nurses, the insurance companies, Everybody has a different plan. Single payer, no payer, this color, blue one, purple one, orange one do. But when they try to reach agreement on a compromise, the system blows apart. And every time we have tried it, it's failed. The question is, are we going to let it fail again? I want to repeal Altman's Law. I don't want it. I'm sorry I wrote it. I didn't plan on it. But, so the question is, can we repeal it? And let's go back. There are three ways we can do it. We can create a government system. We can restructure our existing system, complex as it is. Or we can eliminate the tax preference and the way I talked about Mr. McCain. Now, as I said, there are all kind of positives and negatives of, of, uh, of um, single payer, which I've already talked about, so I won't continue. So let me now focus on the remaining two, which was the subject of the debates, which you had here at Hofstra, I'm proud of you, um, about health care reform. And we had two candidates that articulated the two other issues. Senator McCain put together what we call the tax credit plan. And Senator Obama put together a, what we call a restructuring of the existing system. And even though uh, McCain lost, you can bet your sweet bippies that there were significant numbers of senators and congressmen and power groups that want the McCain plan. It is not dead. <coughs> and so it's worth looking at. And basically what it says is let's do away with the subsidy. Let's provide a refundable tax credit. Let's allow people to buy insurance over across state lines. And it sounds, the second one sounds so simple and right. You know, you guys, you're you all very internet savvy, you buy things on Amazon.com, on eBay, we buy, uh, you know, trips to the Bahamas, we buy, you know, Mercedes, we buy bubblegum, whatever we buy, you know, we don't care where it comes from, we just buy it on the internet. Why shouldn't we be able to buy health insurance on the internet? Sounds, and McCain said that. And the Republicans have been pushing this for years. But let me tell you why you may not want to buy health insurance. We depend upon our states, states like New York, to tell insurance companies that they have to play by a certain set of rules. Now, those of you who work for Emblem may not like all these rules, but they're designed for a variety of reasons, to protect consumers, to provide mandated benefits. 
If all of a sudden you can start buying across state lines, you can start picking and let's just take a state like Alaska that may not have the same set of rules. And if you're a 28 year old and you say, I'm not going to help these 55 year old four year art professors, you know, I'm going to get an insurance policy that meets my needs. Or you're a 50 year old and you say, what are all these people having babies for? I don't want to cover maternity. I'm not going to do that. Or you say, the mentally ill, I'm not going to cover them. You, know, you can tailor your insurance company, just like you do on the internet, to fit your needs. Well, that sounds wonderful, except just think about the poor sick people. You know, all of a sudden, you're going to have the blind insuring the deaf. It's just not, you know, the whole system could break down, unless you introduce national standards. And we found out it's not a part. So this is a little sleeper. Anyway, it's in there, and it will be debated, trust me. S subsidizing, for those people, the millions that won't be able to get health insurance, they'll set up a kind of a, a state system, which is not a bad idea. And then there's a whole bunch of reform. Actually, the Obama plan and the Clinton plan, though, was very similar to Hillary's plan, are much less radical. They're, they're more comprehensive, but they're much less radical. They build on our current system. They say, let's not totally, Hillary learned her lesson, I hope. And that is, if you make this too complicated, Americans are just going to So anyway, this thing builds on it. And man, you know, and this is the Obama plan going in. Mandates coverage for all children. It requires every employer to either provide coverage or to pay into a fund. It subsidizes people that can't afford it to buy insurance. It creates a government plan to sort of compete with private insurance plans. It mandates and restricts health insur uh, insurance companies and requires them to take all takers and not restrict coverage. Now, we in, in New York have those kind of limitations. It restricts private insurance administrative costs. There's a whole bunch of things it does, but it basically builds on our existing system. Now, just to briefly go through, uh, a group called the Lewin Group went and analyzed the, how these two plans would work. And the Obama plan, as, cur as currently written, would reduce the number of uninsured, not to zero. Now, one of the, I, would, I should admit, I was on the team that created the Obama plan. So, and we talked to him, and we said to him, you know, in Massachusetts, there is a requirement that everybody has to have insurance. And not everybody is subsidized. He refused to do that. And the reason why he refused to do it, he said, I am not going to force people to buy insurance that can't afford it. We said, but sir, you're going to leave a lot out. And if you remember the debate, Hillary kept saying, you don't cover everybody. And he kept saying, what are you going to do to the people who don't want to buy it and throw them in jail? Tough issue. But that was then. Mike, on the side, I think when his plan finally comes up and goes to the Congress, it will cover everybody. Exactly how? I don't know. There are different ways to do it. But this plan covers not 47 million, but 26 million. One of the big differences by age between the two the Obama plan is much better for young people, so because it really caters the insurance, and you can buy cheap insurance if you don't have to cover sick people. Nothing, there's nothing better for an insurance company than to have all, you know, to, if you don't have any medical bills, you know, have high premiums, right? I mean, I figured that part <laughs> So, I'm slow, but can I get it? So, you know, the young, if, if you look at the red, you'll notice in 25 to 34, you actually get better coverage in the blue and the red than you do in the yellow. But when you get out to the older groups, those of us who are falling apart, you'll notice that the yellow is much better than the red because, in fact, it requires and guarantees that they get decent coverage. One of the good ways to look at it is the fraction or reduction of the uninsured among people with chronic illness. And there you see the yellow is significantly better than the red. But let's just very quickly get at lowering costs. Both plans do a lot to try to lower costs, but they really, really don't get at the heart of it. Now, I'm not going to go through all these. You know, under the McCain plan, his basic thing is if we, make, if we force people to have to deal with it, they will become concerned. If you have to pay for your own MRI, you're going to start saying, why does it cost them, you know, $1,200 for an MRI? You know, maybe I can get one down the street from an old vendor, you know, with an old machine for only 300 And besides, why do I need that MRI in the first place? We know that, I don't know how many, if I ask, in my class, I have 150 students in my undergraduate class. I ask them, how many of you have had MRIs? Half the class raised their hand. I said, what are you, all dying? What is this? 
MRIs was supposed to be the ultimate piece of equipment that you only use when people were very sick and the other things didn't work. Now it's kind of routine to use. You know, your, your big toe hurts and you call the doctor and, you, and they go and say, well, go get an MRI. What do I need an MRI? My toe hurts. They said, well, you know, it could be broke, could be cancer. <laughs> cancer of the big toe. It's a big epidemic nowadays, particularly in Long Island. You've got to do an MRI. Well, if I have paid, you know, if your insurance pays for it, you don't give a damn, you go get an MRI, stick a foot in there, take a picture of your guy, it's a thousand bucks. He said, well, but if you had to pay for it, you go, you know what, I'm just going to tape my toe. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you know, he, so he says, if we do that, we can save a lot of money, and there are all these benefits, and oh, by the way, we can re-import drugs, you know, from Canada, you go up there and fill up your pockets with drugs or you swim across the Rio Grande and go to Mexico and you get, now, you know, I don't think it's a big deal, but Americans think somehow they can save a lot of money by re-importing drugs. At one point I think it was a big deal, but now that we have drug coverage it's much less. And another big debate is malpractice reform. And um, that's a big debate. If you talked in yesterday's New York Times, you know, if you ask doctors, they believe that, you know, if we only solve the malpractice, Thing, everything would be beautiful. Now, as a phys if you're a physician, how many <laughs> physicians in the audience? We have a few. Good. All right. You know what? I, I can sympathize with this. I, I think this malpractice has gone too far. The idea that if you if you have a baby and it's not an immediate 160 IQ on the Olympics, immediately signed up, uh, you know, immediate uh, admissions to Hofstra, um, you know, you begin to say the doctor screwed up, you know, and and um, you sue. Not a good thing. So I'm for malpractice reform. Do I think it's the most important problem in American medical? Nonsense. But it is a problem. Not only that, he said, well, you know, if we, didn't, we weren't going to get sued, we wouldn't do all these things. Well, that would be good. I mean, if we do less of them, I don't believe it. I think you still do a lot of the tests. But it's a problem that we need to deal with. When you go to the Obama plan, and since he's the president, for those of you who have been around, so he's going to be the president. So what he, yes, what he is proposing is going to be a real issue. And there's some really good stuff in here. One, health information technology. The truth of the matter is we need a system that talks to each other. And we will never get it completely unless we have some help. If you're an average physician in a small practice, you can't afford to put in the kind of software and hardware you need. So the government needs to help contribute. McCain talked about it, but Obama puts money in there. And very important. And over time, that will both improve quality and reduce costs. Another very important thing is what we call comparative effectiveness. We are the, one of the few major countries that does not do what we call comparative effectiveness research, which that means is that not only do you approve a drug or device and say it's safe, you actually compare and see how much better it is than what's already there. And in other countries, if something comes on the new market and they want to sell it for $100,000 and it actually helps by 1%, the government says no, because you can do something else. But we don't do that. So we need to get about doing it, and in the Obama plan there is research to do that. There's malpractice, Medicare overpayments, which is the claim that Medicare Advantage plans get too much money. I'm not going to talk about that. It's an emblem of breakfast. You know, if they do that, no more breakfast. Um, um, but we can talk about that later. And there's a bunch of other things. And one of the important things is the medical home. Now, I am so pleased to hear that Hofstra is about to create a new medical school. I just hope that you don't do what your brethren are doing, which is we are not training any more primary care physicians. We are getting so negative. Less and less physicians are going into primary care. We have the lowest ratio in the world among major industrial countries. I hope when this medical school comes online, it will be a beacon for new forms of primary care. But to help you do that, we have to change the payment system. We are paying our specialists too much relative to primary care. Primary care physicians need to be paid more. And one way we are working to do that is to create something called the medical home, which is 
to actually give primary care physicians more money and actually have them coordinate care. I'll let your faculty and, or others talk about that in more detail. Very important. So there's a whole host of things here to improve care. Now, here's come to the end and then I'll stop. We, now, we are now at a, a very critical phase. And to me, it looks a lot like 1964 in the following sense. In 1964, Lyndon Johnson became president with a landslide Democratic majority, the likes of which we had not seen since the Great Depression. He made, as a, really his number one priority, the passage of Medicare. And I won't go into all the gyrations about it, but he got had a Democratic Congress, and, and he was a strong leader. And we did something that we never had done before. We created a government finance system for a significant number of people. You know, people take Medicare for granted. Trust me. If 64 hadn't have come about, we may still not have had Medicare. We have that opportunity again. By the way, we also need to deal with Medicare. Medicare is going to be a problem, but let me not get into that right away. We are out of presence. We have a Democratic president. We have the largest majority of Democrats in the House and the Senate we've ever seen in a long time. We have a president who's committed to do something. And I think we have an opportunity, and we will do something. The problem is, will we do it in a way that gets enough support? I think there's going to be a, there is, well, I don't think, I know, there's going to be a huge fight within the reform group to sort of go much further than where Obama was. And some of you, some of them may like it, you know, let's have the government run the whole thing. I think we could overreach similar to what happened under Clinton. I hope we don't do that. I'm very pleased to see Senator Baucus, who was the chairman of the Finance Committee last week, came out with a health reform plan, which is a moderation plan. Senator Kennedy, who's a wonderful senator, is now seems like he, he might have enough stamina to be there and, run the show, he's a good compromiser. We need to learn how to compromise. This is not something that you can just ram through the Congress. But we have an opportunity we have not had before. And I hope we have the opportunity to do it right. Because it's just wrong to have 50 million Americans with no health insurance, to have costs that are totally out of control, that are bankrupting companies. You know, you're hearing a big thing about the autos. You should see the size of their medical bills. So, you know, I want Altman's law repealed. I want it done. And I think we can do it. So, with our help, with everyone pushing for it, we got a shot. So, at that point, I think I'll stop. And maybe you can Shalala before she became, I mean, people knew her, but she was not on any list. Uh, 
Um, and uh, so I, that's part of it. But the big part of it is who's in the Congress. We cannot dismiss that. And there are big differences between the House of Representatives and the Senate. So if you go to the House of Representatives, the most, two of the most dominant people are extremely liberal uh, congressmen, one from California, Pete Stark, who's on the Ways and Means Committee, who's number two in line, right behind uh, Congressman Rangel. And we know Congressman Rangel's had a few little problems here. And even if he doesn't, he relies on Pete Stark. <coughs> and then in the House of, in the Interstate and Foreign Commerce, there's Senator Waxman, uh, Congressman Waxman, who is now trying to unseat Rangel, um, uh, uns Dingle, for the leadership. Both of those people have a lot of influence, and they're very liberal, and they would not be against having the government on the whole show. When you go to the Senate, it's very different. Senate is a more conservative body. Senator Baucus is from, um, from Montana, the ranking Republican of Grassley is from Iowa. You know, one little side story, then I'll get The difference between the House and the Senate is like day and night. You know, House of Representatives, everyone gets one vote, you know, big cities have a lot of power. So if you go to the Ways and Means Committee, the former head of it was from Chicago, now the head of it's from New York, they can be from Los Angeles, they're all from big cities. You go to the Senate Finance Committee, they're from towns with 12 people, 15 people, you know, and one time when I was chairing the committee, the PROPAC, you know, I went to the House of Representatives and they were cheering me on and I was doing, I got to the Senate and the head of the Senate was the Senator of the party. And, he, and he, he was furious at me. He was saying, you are killing people in, in, uh, in rural areas. I tried to explain to him, I come from the rural Bronx. It didn't work. <laughs> it, didn't, it, was like, it was like day and night. Who's on? People from West Virginia, South Dakota, Wyoming. I tell you, there's nobody there, but they get two senators. So very different. They're going to have a very different vote. So I think it's going to be a very interesting battle. Yes, sir. My first question is, where are the Bronx? <laughs> I grew up in the West Bronx, two blocks off the Grand Concourse on Townsend Avenue and 177th Street. Yeah, right here, right University and Jerome Avenue. Yes, right exactly. So, Jerome Avenue, the L, Jerome Avenue, yeah. absolutely. So, with that said, you've given us so much to think about. I think the, the point you made about primary care is just so significant, and the New England Journal of Medicine is printing all sorts of editorials about that these days. So, I think we, we need to take that into consideration. I have a list of probably 50 questions, so I'm going to reduce it to one. Uh, Regina Hersley, at Harvard Business, has written a lot about this. She has a, a very uh, strong desire to see a consumer-based movement created here. Can, can you comment on, on consumers? Well, I'm glad you focused on that question. <laughs> She's a piece of work. Very smart, very articulate. Um, um, there's another health economist by the name of Jamie Robinson, who's out of Berkeley. And Jamie has written a book and he says, all right, you know, the government has failed to control health care spending. Insurance companies have failed to control health care spending. The health care industry has failed to control health care spending. So let's get the consumers to do it. You know, poor, the poor consumers, you know. You know, could just... So, you know, we're going to go out there, like I said, with the MRIs, and we're going to learn, and we're going to decide, you know, whether we want the blue one or the red one. You know, this one's $9.95, this one's $7.50, you know, by the $7.50. The truth of the matter is 80% of our spending are for very sick people. Can you imagine sick people, they're on the gurney, they're dying, and they go, now, how much does this cost now? Do I get the blue one or the red one? Can I just have the cheapy version today? You know, so, uh, you know, am I in favor of consumers having more stake in the game? Absolutely. Do I think it's the number one way to solve the health care problem? Not only that, Americans don't want to do it. They, the people that want to do it are the young and the healthy. Have, have you ever met a sick person that says, you know, I want to be, you know, control my, you know, I want to have some say, I understand that, but do I want to pay my bills? No. The other thing that Reggie says, you know, she has the focus factory stuff. Do I believe in specialization? Yes. I'm an economist. I believe, you know, if we do a lot of things, same thing, we get better at it. 
Unfortunately, the way special and this is a long story. The way specialization is changed, uh, created in this country. If you go around this country and find out how we specialize, you have not so much. It's against the law in New York and in Massachusetts. But you go outside, and I, for those of you who don't know, the rest of the country isn't like us. They have they function differently. So you go to Indianapolis and to, to Arizona and places like that. They have this competition between specialty hospitals. And, now, what are they specializing in? Heart, uh, radiology, orthopedics, and what they specialize is in the high pay. Not only that, what they do is they don't co cover the uninsured. They don't provide any of the, the co coverage for Medicaid. So in other words, what we have seen is a taking, not a bad idea, Reggie's idea, and we have subverted a lot of our delivery systems. Now, with that said, do I believe that we should have the government do the whole thing? No. Do I believe that she has some kernels of truth? Absolutely. Do I believe that if we just did what she wanted, we'd solve all our problems? Nonsense. Now, now the other book in there is, is Secretary Levitt's personalized medicine program. Can you comment on that? Well, you know, again, I'm not, you know, maybe it's me. I mean, there's just the research just isn't there. Prevention is a wonderful thing. Having people concerned about their health is a wonderful thing. We all need to be concerned about it. Prevention doesn't, we don't know enough. We don't know enough. Like, with all due respect, how many of you are joggers? You are a disgrace. You run out there, you know, your knees go, you get hit by cars, you know, you get the flu, you know. Has it been happening yet? Has it? I was just talking to somebody who came. He said, how did you know I get that by car twice? <laughs> I'm just kidding. The point is that you should you look wonderful. And the kids look at him, look at him. He jogs in. It's wonderful to see. You know, it's great. You know, we, we drink the right, you know, green tea and we eat the right foods. But, the, the, you know, like smoking, for example. If we want to save money, we should let people smoke. They die quickly, you get rid of them. <laughs> now that we live, you know, 85, 90, and your gallbladders go, stuff like that. The problem is, prevention does not save a lot of money. Is it a wonderful thing to do? Of course. I'm so pleased with the job. I'm up early in the morning, I'm, you know, playing the tennis. And I, I've even learned how to play tennis on an airplane. Um, it's, um, so my, again, what, excuse me, politicians, don't want to deal with the tough stuff. You know what the tough stuff is? To tell somebody who's 85 years old that his doctor told them they need a new heart, that you can't have it. Because you'll probably live another you know, six months and it's going to cost half a million dollars. Or doing dialysis on a 95 year old. Or uh, you know, doing transplants that don't work. Or doing the fifth MRI uh, because you're not sure. It's that. And that's where the money is. And that's hard to do. Or saying to people, you know, you can't make the money you're making. You know, we're going to cut your salaries. Uh, we're going to spend less money. So, again, personalized care, fine. I'm not against it. Specialization, I'm not against it. But we need to get about doing the tough stuff. And that's the easy stuff. And no one is against it. How can you be against it? So, um, you know, I, uh, you know, Reggie is a very, you know, if you know her and you may have seen her, very smart, very pervasive. We've been on a number of programs together. I love reading her books. Um, there is no magic bullet to this thing. Um, it's tough. Other, you know, other countries spend less money. They spend less money. They have budgets. Would the Swiss model work here? Huh? Would the Swiss model work here? Mo yes. I think, well, I don't think any, you know, we're America. We're going to do our own. Is there things we can learn from the Swiss or from the Dutch? I think so. But there's also things we can learn from the Scandinavians about how we deal with our elderly. I think that the German system is an interesting system that deserves more attention. There are things we can learn from other countries, but at the end, we're going to create our own botched up, confused, expensive. It's America. You know, we created the DRG system. You're probably familiar with it. Students, um, the most complicated way of paying for it. I love it. You know, look at Medicare.
part D. Who in the world would ever have created a drug benefit that is with donut holes and with thousands of insurance companies doing things that are... I love it. It's, it's a, for consultants, it's fantastic. <laughs> I go on cruise ships to explain to seniors how to do it. I sail to Panama. It's wonderful. It's, it's, it's America. It's medical tourism. That's exactly right. Medical tourism. You know, so, in, in that context, with respect to Part D, should the government become the negotiator of Part D prices? Well, you know, if you go into Medicare, Medicare negotiates the price for every item it buys except one, drugs. Do I think at the end of the day Medicare will negotiate? Well, first of all, that is a misnomer. Governments don't negotiate. <coughs> Governments set prices. You know, can you imagine the average uh, doctor saying, all right, I'm going to go to the government and negotiate with them about how much I'm going to get or the average hospital. So, do I believe over time the government will administer prices for pharmaceuticals? Yes. Do I believe they're going to save a ton of money by doing it? No. Actually, the, I believe Part B has really worked a little, much better than the critics believe. But it is still very complicated. And Americans don't like it. They live with it. I can live with it. But I think there's going to be tremendous pressure to change Medicare Part D. Thank you. Sure, my pleasure. Yes? You spoke a little bit about comparative effectiveness. Yes. I'm wondering your thoughts about, um, clearly there are conflicts when a hospital decides what's the proper treatment or an insurance company decides what's the proper treatment. But what do you think about the independent body that focuses on health outcomes as deciding what's the proper treatment? You know, I, I, you know, I'd like to see that happen. Uh, that's what the Dashiell, Dashiell wants to create a kind of a Federal Reserve an independent body that's separate from politics and separate from that sets some of these rules. I, you know, one of the battles that's taking place, for those of you who are you know, involved with, but, you know, I've been very involved with Compare Effect, there are two pieces of it, or maybe three or four. One is just doing the research. Let's, so that there are more New England Journal articles about, you know, this works better than that, and this costs more than that. I think we need to go about doing that, independent of everything else. The next question is, what do we do with the knowledge? Now, some people want to have, in the same agency, the decision of A, how to design a new benefit design. So you could do it like drugs, you know, it says, you know, you want to continue to use a brand, you pay 40 bucks a month. You want to use a generic, you pay 5 bucks or 10 bucks a month. But you can get anything you want. So one option is to say, you want that what's he does it machine? that really is three times or four times more expensive than the other one, you have to pay more for it. That gets, well, by the way, a little more at that consumerism. That may be a good option. Now, whether we will have one group in the government that decides for everything, I think, is unlikely. Some people have suggested a Federal Reserve System. Yes, like Dash. Right, right. The problem, and it's interesting, my understanding is politicians don't want to leave they don't, they don't want to leave their hands off this thing. It's, it's um, for example, recently the government decided that it was going to have something called competitive bidding for Medicare for durable equipment, you know, like wheelchairs and oxygen and stuff like that. And they worked for three years, three years, to create a complex bidding system in all parts of in different regions and they had groups bidding and then they picked the top three or the top ten. They went through an elaborate process and they finally finished. And in ten regions of the United States, big regions, they finished. They got it all worked out. They picked the ten deliverers and so on and so forth. They lowered the spending. The losers, did they just say, oh gee, this is terrible. Oh, get none of this. Nope. They went right to their politicians. They went right to their Congress. And people like Pete Stark got up in the House of Representatives and destroyed the whole thing. So here we had an independent group, Medicare, non-politic, and they had the authority written into law. And the politics, even the New York Times wrote about it. Do I think we need it? Yes. Do I think we'll do it? I don't think so. Okay. Stuart, you said you were very proud 
of, of Massachusetts yes. hasn't been able to produce, and I'm sure you have a, a strong hand in that. But what also strikes me is that it seems to have it's an exception to the Altman law. Yes. So from that experience, can you discuss on a national level perhaps what lessons there might be uh, yes. out of the Massachusetts? Well, law? it's what I said, David. It's, it was designed to not be disruptive. It got everybody into the process. No group opposed it. The hospitals were supported. The doctors were supported. How did they, have, how did they get everybody to buy into it? It was a very, you know, I had very relatively little to do with it, actually. It, you know, and, it, you know, it, it may come as a big shock to you. Actually, even Governor Romney, you know, before he decided that he hated it, he loved it. And, <laughs> and uh, he was a part of it. It was a true team effort. They, they did it right. And as I said, I, I, I you know, I was, you know, chipping on the side, but I didn't have a lot to do with it. And they got, they had good politicians, they worked together, they fought about it. Some people wanted an old, more government payments, some people wanted less. And they put, it, is it perfect? No. Um, does it have problems? Yes. We don't have enough primary care doctors, it's generated a lot of demand. We have not figured out a way to control costs, so the costs are skyrocketing. We've got to figure out how to do that. But most, more and more people are covered. It does it have lessons for the, for the country? Absolutely. The, and that's where the Obama, the Obama and the Clinton plan were modeled after Massachusetts. Or they both come from the same source. It isn't so much that they... It, what's in Massachusetts is a version of... If you want to know, if you go back and read the bill that I helped write in 1974 for Nixon, you'll see a lot of the same things. You know, require every employer to provide coverage or to pay into a fund, pay or play as we called it. It, it was a team effort. Now, so what I'm trying to say at the national level is if you can get agreement among, among large groups to support it, but if you go after them, for example, in the Clinton plan, when they finally came out, they basically said, we're going to destroy insurance companies. Uh, we're going to go after the pharmaceutical industry. We're going to do this, we're going to do that, and inform the bank, and we're going to have these big, complex order, and Americans rebelled. So, yeah, I think there are lessons. It's not so much line by line, that can be different, but that they really brought a lot of people along before they jammed it down their throats. And, that, and it worked. You know, Mass, you know, Massachusetts is not like the rest of the country, you know. But then, you know, you know you're much closer here in New York than, than you know, Wyoming. So, Wyoming, forget about it. I mean, let their four people out of it. Out of <laughs> But there's lessons to be learned, yeah. I recently uh, had a chance to hear Shannon Brownlee speak, who wrote this book called Yes, Black right. Yeah. And she went through it in pretty good detail as to where the excess, if you call it excess spending is, and, you know, by region, look at all the Medicare data, and it's where the machines are, where the supply of doctors is. Um, and I guess, so how can you, um, if you're not going to use a market mechanism to get that, to get at that, do you use a regulatory mechanism? To, I mean, how do you, you know, you talk about the hard work, how do you get there? Well, it's a good question. Easy to find and hard to do. You know, you're part of the, New York's part of the problem, oh, I hate to tell you. Yeah, <laughs> you're not as bad as Florida. I mean, it, uh, you know, you're up there, um, particularly out here. Um, so, how do you go about doing it? Well, you can, we got a couple of choices. And, you know, there's no one right way. One is you begin, government begins to say, you know, this is what we're going to pay for. And you want to have, you know, excess, um, you're going to have to pay more. You know, in, in Canada, for example, they have a national system and they have a provincial system. And some provinces give more than others. And the provinces have to pay more. So if New York wants to wind up giving more services than this national body, it'll say, fine, New York, you tax yourself, um, or you or you have insurance premiums that are higher. That's one way. The other is, as you pointed out, you know, have individuals pay more. But some of us 
you know, we're kind of like medical junkies. I mean, you come to Massachusetts, everybody's a doctor or works in healthcare. You know, there are four people that don't work. If you don't work in either healthcare or education, we used to have a fine financing group too, you know, Fidelity and places like that. Other than that, we don't have any employers. We don't produce anything in Massachusetts. So, um, you know, so, and we like healthcare. We just go to the doctor for fun. You know, it's, just, it's just something we do. So we should be prepared to pay for it. So, anyway, the bottom line is what other countries do is they limit it. They do limit it. And they don't. The people in Minneapolis and in Seattle and in Portland are so furious at what's going on here and in Florida and in Southern California and how much of their Medicare dollars are going there. They're working like crazy to prevent Medicare from paying the higher rates. They haven't succeeded yet, but I don't have time to go into it, but one of the reasons why Medicare Advantage plans are paid more is that they're paid more primarily in rural areas. And they're paid more in rural areas because the rural people got ticked off that the urban areas were getting so much more money. It's, it's politics. Um, I don't know. You know. I'm not sure we'll ever solve it, actually. <laughs> Uh, you've alluded to it, but can you comment on how we rank as a country in the per capita cost of health care compared to other nations, along with uh, the quality of health care? How we compare to other well, you know, in terms of cost, we're the Olympic gold medal winner. You know, we're 50% higher than the next closest on a per capita basis. I mean, I, I, I have a slide. That, you know, I mean, we're, you know, we're off the charts on a per capita basis. In terms of quality, we're not so good. You know, I mean, I, I have trouble buying into the uh, World Health Organization uh, measures, you know, there were number 28 someplace between Somalia and Kenya. Um, you know, you know number, number one is Italy. Yeah, look, Italy, fine wines, good pasta, great lovers, good health care. France, you know, I don't know how many of you saw Sicko. Anybody see Sicko? You know? Well, that's great. You know, they have all these 32-year-olds smoking with one hand drinking red wine. So the point of the, the, the whole movie is, if you're going to smoke, drink red wine. It kind of balances it. But they also have a lot of doctors, so they do the diapers. I mean, it, there, are, there are advantages of living in France. So, we're not so good. Mortality rates, our longevity are not good. Our immunization rates are not good. There are things we can do better. For some of us, we get pretty good health care. Um, you know, that's why sicko was, you know, sick. I mean, but it wasn't wrong. I mean, there were parts of it that were right. Um, so, anyway, we spend a lot more and we don't get, we don't get enough for what we spend. There's no question about that. We could do better. And, you know, try to figure out how to do it. And it's not all because of the uninsured, it's because of the problem with the primary care, it's maldistribution and so on. It's a, it's a tough problem. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, how do you propose to make health care more affordable for everyone without compromising the quality of health care? You know, that's a very good question. It really is. The, you know, ideally you can do it. Ideally you can do it, which means... But you have if, to monitor them. Well, that's ideally. Ideally in the sense that we know we quote unquote waste a lot of things. <laughs> We spend a lot of money on things that have no or marginal impact on improving access, improving longevity, improving... We know that. Now, just to know it doesn't mean you will do it. So the more likely possibility is that a significant reduction in spending will lead to a possible reduction in quality. Then the question is, is all of the reduction in quality that important, you know? You know what an asymptotic line looks like? You know, it goes like this and then it sort of tries to reach 100 but never does that. We could potentially reduce spending and really have a fairly trivial impact, but the abutted impact on quality a little bit without significantly, and then reallocate the money, it's very hard. It is easy to talk about. It is very hard to do, but there are things we know to what to do: prenatal care, better immunization rates, yes, prevention. I do, in spite of my comments, that 
Um, we know there are things we can do better. Yes, sir. Being the kind of our system operates on supply and demand. That's how our economic system works. And being a health educator, the prevention end uh, and changing the supply and demand through prevention, you're telling me is an easy one, but well, I didn't say it's easy. I think it's, it's easy to say. It's not it's to hard. save us what we need to say. Right. It's not. And don't get me wrong. Let me. You know, I make fun. It isn't. It isn't the panacea that if we just do it, that's all we have to do. Do I believe you should do it? Yes. Do I believe what you're doing is important? Yes. Do I? So I don't. You know what I what I what I rail against are the politicians that only talk about it and think if we do that we've solved all our problems. Because I think that there are tougher problems to deal with. Now prevention turns out to be very hard for a variety of reasons which you know better than I do. It means changing human behavior. And, uh, and, and it's not easy to do. And also, while we know a lot of things, we also don't know a lot of things. You know, I don't know, yesterday I, or today, I forgot which newspaper I picked up, and they were talking about, you know, the, the, the pill that people are taking so that their mind doesn't go to mush, and they're finding it doesn't work, you know, they're trying, you know, people do crossword puzzles so that they're going to keep their mind, you know, what the, the, you know, people say as well, if you do a lot of crossword puzzles, you learn how to make crossword puzzles, you're not going to help your mind. But people believe that, and I don't know, I, I do it, you know, I want to keep going. So, I'm not against prevention, I think it's very important. And I hope we figured out a way to do a better job and learn. But do I think in and of itself it's going to be the panacea? No. I'm, you know, there's just no evidence. Now, maybe I'm wrong. I mean, I didn't do it. I didn't do the research. Yes, ma'am. But in essence, I think what we're doing is, is secondary prevention rather than primary prevention. I agree with you. It is really difficult to change human behavior. Right. But we are not doing primary prevention. We are not teaching people at the very earliest periods of their lives with an opportunity to initiate good behavior rather than wait until we have to change the behavior. You're absolutely right. You know, I mean, the idea that we're so obese at young, you know, but a lot of it has to do with lifestyle. You know, we drive, we don't walk anymore. We, you know, we eat the wrong foods. I mean, I, look, you know what? I want prevention to work. I want to live to 95 and, or 105 or 125. And you tell me what to do. As I said, the evidence isn't there, and maybe you're absolutely right. It's because we're not doing the right thing. I think that, that just to add a piece, that piece belongs in our educational policies. Because we teach kids, or we, we initiate an education about health, one time in middle school and one time in high school, for five days a week for about three months, not possible. Well, so until know. we look at the educational system, we may, and, and I'm, I'm not for a moment suggesting that it's going to dramatically change expenditures or even lifespan, but it will change quality of life. Absolutely. And we haven't, we Absolutely. haven't that much. Absolutely. And I, I'm sorry if you got the wrong impression. As I said, the only thing that I'm opposed to is the people that use it as an excuse for doing other things. But as part of a plan, absolutely. Yes, sir. Uh, since I cannot watch a, a football game or any sports without being inundated with media advertising for prescription drugs, whatever you, no matter what you're watching, it's constant. What I'm asking you is, can you comment on, uh, since the public cannot buy that, all they can do is talk to their doctors and, and, and pose that, can you comment on the, and since that cost, that cost of advertising, which is in the billions, is driving up the cost of drugs, can you comment on how that compares to other countries and whether or not that, that should be uh, uh, discussed from the legislative standpoint? Well, you know, the point is, should we ever have allowed um, <coughs> advertising for prescription drugs? And there's a lot of arguments uh, against it. But again, that, in other countries, they do some of it, but much less than we do. Um, look, it's what I call our uniquely American system. We're not going to stop that. It's uh, freedom of speech. Uh, it's uh, <coughs> now I happen to be one uh, that uh, doesn't believe that advertising is nearly as effective. And I often wonder why they're spending so much money. I mean, ask General Motors. 
how much money they spend on, you know, in between the, the, the Cialis and the Viagra, you know, is, uh, you know, SUVs and, uh, you know, and they're spending more. And I don't know what impact it's having on Viagra, but it's really not having a big impact on General Motors cars. So, you know, advertising has limits. Um, and um, the other thing I say to doctors, you know, they say to us, well, we don't have any control over this. People come in and want this. I said, you're a wimp. We carefully selected you. You're among the best and the brightest. We've wasted years on your education. And this little old man comes in and wants a drug, and you just give it to him, even if you know it's useless. Shame on you. You think so? I don't have the time to fight with him. Unfortunately, though, what happens is if, they, if the doctor says no, they go to another doctor. I know. I know. That's, that's what they tell me. That's the problem. You know, what can I tell you? You know, it's America. <laughs> I don't think in uh, yeah, uh, you know. Uh, and it's, it's, it's also compounding up this painful performance with Medicare, which is going to trickle into everything else. The customer satisfaction, satisfaction is extremely important. And so now, if you do not do what the patients want, it comes back and haunts you. Well, let me tell you what I think is a good thing. And I, and I think these three and four tier drug pricing with its problems is a good thing. So if you are so convinced that the purple pill, you want it, like I was, so all these beautiful women, and I, figured, I didn't know what the purple pill did, but I figured if I could get it, <laughs> why not? So I went to three doctors to get the purple pill, and they kept telling me no. So I finally found somebody to give me the purple pill. And then I went and I found that it was supposed to be $45 a month. And I, I looked at the purple pill and I looked at the $45 and I said, you know, until I know what works, so I said no. The point here is, if you want to buy that drug and it's not on the formulary, and you know, you're going to have to pay a lot of money for it. And you know, I'm a rich guy, you know, I told you I'm a consultant, I'm a professor. <laughs> but you know, when I found that I had to pay you know, 25 to $40 for the continued use of the brand name of it was a generic, I went back to my doctor and I said, isn't there a generic for this? He said, oh yeah. I said, well, why didn't you do it? He said, well, I didn't think you wanted it. I said, I'm going to pay 40 bucks every month. And you know what? We have a higher percentage of the use of generics than most countries in the world. Money, you know, who, who asked me that question, consumerism works in that respect. I mean, people do get concerned about that. I think I'm for that. And, you know, so, you know, if you want Viagra, you know, you're 12 years old. I mean, it's stupid. And if it, I can't stop doctors from writing these prescriptions. I wish they wouldn't. And a lot of my doctor wouldn't. And you're right, I don't disagree that some people do that, but a lot. I mean, I listen to my doctor. You know, I, you know, I said to him, you know, everybody on my block has a stress test. I want a stress test. He said, why do you want a stress test for? I said, because Everybody on the block has a stress test. They say you're over 55, you have to have a stress test. He, and he started explaining. He said, I don't care, I'll do a stress test. I'll make all this money on stress test. He said they're a waste for people that don't have these symptoms. So I went home. I was the only kid on my block without a stress test. <laughs> but the point here is that doctors need to say no. They just need to say no. And second, if they finally say yes, the insurance companies want to ding them or the government and say, you know, you don't need this stuff, but, and, the, you know, it's not on the formulary, you don't have, and so, I mean, what else can I say? We are not going to stop the advertising. I'm sorry. I don't think it has that big impact, but I think we won't. Yes, sir. The uh, percentage of the elderly will double by 2030, and all the money is actually spent in the last year. Why? How do we do with well, that? Well, that, first of all, Yes, we are going to double. I think you, you know, let's. I, I agree with you. You know, it's something like thirty percent of Medicare money goes in the last year of life. It is a ton of money. One of the things that really does separate this country from other companies is the high cost of dying. We, that's where comparative effectiveness comes in. So you hit the right tone, and that is we do so much more than other countries in the process of people still dying. Can we change that? You want to talk about having an impact on spending, 
that is where you have a big impact. Very hard to do. It's, it's a combination of religious things, uh, you know. Uh, it's a combination of knowledge. Uh, we don't know. Um, you know, often people go beyond their physicians. Physicians say, you know, we've done everything. You find another th tough issue. Other countries say no. And then, you know, if you want it, you got to go out of that country. You got to buy it on your own. Are we going to say, I think the answer is, at some point, we have to say no. I mean, I left out this one slide, but this is the Medicare problem. This is a huge problem. Medicare is in yellow. That's the percent, that's with no change in our coverage. The percentage of our GDP going to Medicare. And med, the first one is uh, Social Security, Medicare. Hash is uh, prescription drugs, and green is, is uh, Medicaid. So by the year 2030, we'll be using between 16 and 20 percent of our total gross domestic product. We have to get out of this problem. You're absolutely right. Yes, ma'am. Yes, as we expand coverage, what are your thoughts about how we'll actually make sure that translates into um, expanding access? And I'm thinking specifically about what happens to providers leaving the system. Well, that's a tough question. I don't disagree. First, we need to change the payment system. I didn't talk about the payment system. A fee-for-service payment system is a god. It's the worst. We need to pay what we call value-based pricing. We need to pay more for things that work. Um, and we need to design our benefit package, our insurance, more along value-based pricing. Um, pay more to people that do more, not things that work, not just do more things. And unfortunately, the fee-for-service system, A, rewards doing, not value. Second, it overcompensates for the latest what's he does at machines. And, and you know, just, you know, the one um, machine that it doesn't pay a lot for is the brain. So if we don't change the payment system, what you're saying is absolutely correct. And that gets to primary care. Basically, what we're telling people in primary care is what you do is not that valuable. And I think it's wrong. Will we do it? You know what? We started to do it in 1985. Here we are in 2008. We changed the payment system under Medicare and RBRBS in 1985-86 and with the express purpose of paying primary care more. And what happened is the specialists took control of the system and they made sure they got theirs. I guess what I'm thinking of is um, already we have providers that don't accept the insurance up front, they want payment, and then whatever you get from your insurance is between you and the insurance. And I just wonder if we can anticipate that there will be more physicians or uh, specifically who opt out of the system, if you will, and just deal with Well, the you know what, I, I, can't, I, I can't predict, but I can predict, the, I, I'm not sure, but I can predict a few things. If we clamp down, as we are doing, on payments under insurance, but more importantly under government payments, but under both, you will see more doctors doing what you said. For example, concierge medicine. I thought it was a joke when it started. It is not a joke anymore. Um, you know, for that, for those of you who don't know, what they say is, you know, um, I'm a doctor who say, look, I'm only going to limit my patients to those people who pay me $2,500 a year before, so, and I'm going to take a limit, and then I'm going to charge my insurance companies for things that they cover. And we say, well, what's the $2,500 for? I will love you. I will be nice to you. I will see you. And you say, wow. So in the beginning, you know, a few rich people, people that have a lot of money, I mean, who pay $2,500 for love to your doctor? Get it sounds myself. So, but, but, more and more communities where the doctor says, you know, if you, if there are no doctors if you don't pay the 25, and you go to New York City, you know, it's not only love. So, yes, I think there's a real possibility. Time to go? All right. Huh? Okay.
It's um, uh, the first of the lecture series that will culminate with our 2010 conference, New Directions in American Healthcare. And it's close to the end of Hofstra's Educate 08 program. Um, and as I'm sure you all know, Hofstra hosted the last of the presidential campaign debates. And in connection with that, the university has supported a wide set of events, including this one, that have analyzed and considered the social and political concerns that our nation faces. So, in light of Professor Altman's coming here as we end Educate 08, we want to present him with a gift which says on it, Hofstra University, Educate 08. Thank you. We want to thank um, Emblem Health for its support, not just of this lecture, but of the lecture series that it's part of. And we want to acknowledge the presence here of Karen Chaikin, who's really here, I suppose, in two roles. She works for Emblem Health, but in addition, Dr. Altman's chair bears her family name. We want to thank all of you for participating and making this event the event it was. The next in the series, um, in the next lecture in this series will be in February. It will feature Richard Umbenstock, the CEO of the American Hospital Association, Michael Dowling, CEO of North Shore LIJ, and Art Gianelli, CEO of the Nassau University Medical Center, will be here to respond to Mr. Umbenstock's lecture. That event will take place on February 13, and we'll give you more details as we get closer um, to the event. We look forward to seeing all of you at that one at the one that will occur in the fall of 09 and at the 2010 conference. Thank you so much.